work. Everything okay? Hmm. Gillian, what is it? What's wrong? Jamie, I've become a junker. A junker? Gillian, but why? Jamie, you know why. It's the only way we can regain our lost memories. Snatcher is the only word that keeps coming back every time we try to remember our past. I have to face them to find out why. Yes, but I can sense that there is something terrible hidden in our past. And if we remember it, it will destroy us. Jamie! I'm going now. Jamie! What? I can't hear you! Estimated age, 31. Three years ago, he and his wife, Jamie Seed, are taken into protective custody in the Siberian neutral zone by the 17th Siberian Investigative Force. Both Gillian and Jamie suffer from severe amnesia. Their memories of events prior to being picked up in Siberia lost in a mysterious mental fog. Two years ago, after a vain attempt to rebuild their marriage, Jamie and Gillian separate. Following extensive special military training, Gillian is ordered to report to Neo Kobe City as a junker, effective today. It was an overcast day in 1996, and me and my big brother were scouring the outdoor market in the bustling metropolis of Northwich on the hunt for second-hand games. If anyone's familiar with small UK market towns, you'll know the score here. The market was a uniquely British site, a sort of clockwork orange version of a Victorian big top. On the market stalls themselves was a vast array of tat, the likes of which the world might never see again. Fruit and vegetables, knockoff Count Ducula t shirts, replacement vacuum bags and tins of metal polish, from revolting, dirt cheap women's lingerie to grubby, loose, real Ghostbusters figures with a couple of limbs missing. It was truly magnificent stuff to behold. The owner, if you will, of the game stall was your typical shifty looking, chain smoking, middle aged misanthrope, the kind who used to reduce little kids to tears by offering them 50p for their entire Mega Drive collection. Anyway, as every kid in the town knew, the miserable old bastard at the game stall occasionally turned up the odd gem, so he quite often partake in this video game truffle hunt. By 1996, the Mega CD, or Sega CD if you live in the new world, was considered outdated junk. Me and my brother had had a good time with the Mega CD for a couple of years, and the early multimedia CD-ROM era had been a pretty exciting time, all things considered. So where do you go from here? What's the next level out there? What are you going to do with all that imagination of yours? Well, the journey starts here. This little baby is only the tip of the iceberg. Soon the story continues with the arrival of the Sega Mega CD. Imagine a machine with over 500 megabytes of power, used only for games play. Two 16-bit processors and enough capacity to use real film imagery and CD quality sound. Add a Mega CD and turn your Mega Drive into a monster. When you bought that Mega Drive, you bought your ticket to ride. It's coming, so get tooled up. Blow your mind with the ultimate peripheral to your Mega Drive. Only the Mega CD can give you such awesome games play. I am your passport to the future. Unpleasant odor. You have just been invaded by Sega TV! Tonight, we bring you... Wildlife! Oh, 
This is Megan, start of a new Sega game. Megan, what's it like to be a Mega CD star? Real tough. <laughs> you try dying 2,000 times a day. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Billy from Romford. You don't zap her on my show. The weather. The weather is... Whether you could do this move. Commercial break. Sega Mega Drive. Got one? Now you can get Mega CD. Oh, quick, take the trip. Whoa! It comes with seven games that even plays your music, 3D. Okay, Megan, let's get interactive. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what I call Mega CD. Despite not fulfilling the grand claims at the time that FMV games were the future of gaming, I do have warm memories of FMV games, and they certainly did have a unique feel. In recent years, I've actually really enjoyed playing some of the more recent ones on PS4 and PC. But I digress, in 96 the Mega CD was just old. The upshot of this was that Mega CD games were also often dirt cheap, and I believe we picked up Snatcher for the princely sum of, wait for it, five pounds. We also got a few more games that day too, I believe. Probably Tomcat Alley and Lethal Enforcers with the gun. And possibly even the old time classic that is Ground Zero Texas. Those were the days at Ground Zero. I'm DeSalvo, second in command of this operation. Seems pretty quiet today, except for the board housewives across the street. Well, I've got to get back to work. I'll check in with you later. Now, unlike these days when you can pretty much watch a new game in its entirety on YouTube before it's even been released, back in the 90s, you probably knew precious little about a game before you actually bought it. You might have caught sight of a game playing on the corner-mounted CRT of a local game shop, for example, or caught a glimpse of it on Games Master or Bad Influence, heard word of mouth from your mates, or read a review in a magazine, but that was about it really. And usually I'd see a new game in a shop without even knowing of its existence whatsoever. Buying a game back then was basically a leap of faith, and quite an expensive leap of faith too. I knew precisely zilch about Snatcher. I've looked up these magazine articles for the making of this little video, and it seems there wasn't a great deal of coverage even back then, although it was received quite positively it seems. It was released late in the Mega CD's life, and seems to be another one of those titles that just kind of snuck out of the door, largely unnoticed, towards the tail end of the console's life. That being the case, no pun intended, packaging was of prime importance, and I remember Snatcher's packaging very well indeed. They had a super cool 80s movie poster style cover, and the screenshots on the back showed Terminator-like robots and a Deckard-like dude pointing a gun at me. Wicked. We knew nothing of Hideo Kojima whatsoever at that point. If anything, the strongest brand recognition was that of Konami itself, who churned out a lot of cool, high-quality stuff in the 16-bit era. Anyway, it looked cinematic, it looked anime, and it looked sci-fi. And that was more than enough for us. I know, I know. All right, allow me to introduce the Navigator, which I designed especially for you. Hey, Metal Gear, get out here. Introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Pleased to meet you, Gillian. I am Metal Gear Mop 2. I am programmed to be your personal assistant. Metal Gear? That's a pretty weird name. Oh, he's cute. Uh, thank you. I think he's turning red. I took his basic design and his name from the Metal Gear Menace of the late 20th century. But uh, quite unlike that Metal Gear, this one was designed for peaceful purposes. Oh, that's right. Uh, don't panic yourself. I got it right over here. This is your blaster, the official weapon of a junker. It's got full user feedback circuitry, adjusting itself to your reaction time. In other words, it's just as good as you are. What do you think? Here, see how she feels.
It's unbelievably light. <laughs> you bet it is. This ain't one of those ray guns the army uses. She's put together with the latest carbon polymers and ceramics, not affected by heat one bit. And her ergonomic design optimizes both functionality and firepower. Well, what do you think, Gillian? I'll take it. We got it back home, and I remember plugging the thing in on the downstairs TV for some reason, and also connecting it to my dad's old stereo in order to blast it out of the old Wharfdale speakers. And that was a good decision, as the intro to this game is awesome. To be honest, it sounded comically outdated even at the time. You have to remember in the 90s, the 80s weren't cool and retro yet, they were just old and tacky. But the sound quality and the production values and arrangement of the track itself was impressive and very cinematic. And then, as the game started, I got a bit confused. Snatcher is a visual novel, a genre well established in Japan at that time, but almost completely alien to us in the West. I was a big fan of Akira and Ghost in the Shell, and I loved the anime aesthetic of the artwork in Snatcher, but to be honest we were just baffled by the gameplay style. Basically you pick a heading from a list, and then read loads of text off the screen. To be honest, we just kind of shrugged our shoulders and moved on to more visceral pursuits. A couple of months went by and in stepped my mate from school, Kev, an absolute brain box of a boy who ended up going to either Oxford or Cambridge in the end, I think. We were mates back then and he came over to my house one night, inquired about this weird anime style Mega CD game and promptly started thrashing his way through it. I remember drifting off to sleep at one point and waking up at like 2am to find that Kev was now midway through the game. It was then that I became hooked, although I had to start my own game afresh of course, having missed about 3 hours of content. And I'm really glad I did so, because I stand by my conviction that the world of Snatcher is one of the most evocative settings in video game history. from Jean-Jacques Gibson coming in. Connecting. Junker HQ, this is Gibson. I've cornered a probable male snatcher. I'm in the abandoned factory in the M District. Request immediate backup. Gillian, that means you. You better head out right away. Jean needs your help. We must hurry. We'll use a turbo cycle to travel to the scene. Be careful, Gillian. This is a turbo cycle, specially designed for Junker use. In addition to three-wheeled ground travel, it is capable of hovering and high-speed flight. The vehicle is also VTOL capable, so takeoffs and landings in narrow areas present no difficulty. A flying tricycle, huh? I just came in on one of these things. We have been assigned this vehicle for use in our investigations. Now this. 
Ace Junker Gibson is corner of the suspected snatcher. I wonder if this guy really is a snatcher. Guess I'll find out now if all that training really paid off. Neo Kobe City still has a big lure for me to this day, what I wouldn't give to wander through its seedy, neon-lit anime streets. Despite its outright theft of elements from Blade Runner and Terminator, it somehow manages to create an absolutely unique vibe. Some of its distinctiveness comes from the vast amount of detail in the game's descriptions that really help to flesh out and give texture to the game world, a Kojima trait that he would hold on to for many years. Then there was the anime presentation itself, and the mind-bending, sinister, and cool as a cue Mega Drive FM synth score. Some of it came from the highly memorable, likeable, and just plain funny central cast. Alright, I've had it. Don't call me anymore, okay? Wait a minute, Napoleon. I'll keep any snatchers off your back. They're after both of us. You better worry about watching your own back. Ah, oh, by the way, here. A little Christmas present for you. What? Tissues? See ya. Merry Christmas and some of it from the tight as a nut storyline that is by turns frightening, fascinating, melodramatic and completely ludicrous. In the best possible way, of course. Did I kill him? He has only lost consciousness. Excellent shot, Gillian, hitting him in the hand like that. That's not exactly how I planned it. All right, buddy, time to wake up. Whoa, man, don't shoot, don't shoot! Gillian, while your earlier shot is justifiable as self-defense, killing this suspect would violate Section 5, Article 2 of the Junker Bylaws. You must first have concrete evidence that he is a snatcher. Damn. We should search his bathroom. We may find sunscreen there. Good point. Okay. So, that about explains everything, doesn't it? Yes. It appears that Ivan was simply trying to conceal the fact that he is a drug user. An air surfer, huh? Plenty of suntan oil. Out there soaking up lots of ultraviolet rays. And tanned quite brown by those rays as well. But he doesn't have so much as a pimple. Not what I'd call your typical artificial skin user. Ivan is apparently not a snatcher. All right, buddy, get up. Hey, I only do liquid sky, dude. Just once in a while. I swear, I don't touch anything else. Don't hurt me, man. Come on. Call me an ambulance, will you? I'm no cop. I'm a junker. I couldn't care less if you're a buyer, a pusher, or what. What I want to know is if you're a snatcher or human. Gillian, Ivan's skin is healthy. There is no way he could be a snatcher and tan like that without developing melanoma. Blade Runner is one of my favourite films of all time. This game doesn't so much owe it a debt as owe it a gigantic out-of-court settlement, but I have to admit that this game actually has about twice as much conflict, intrigue and character development as does that magnificent movie. There's a moment near the start of the game where Gillian Seed, now there's a name that would get you beaten up in school back where I come from, 
arrives on the scene at an abandoned factory to assist fellow junker John Jack Gibson that still sends a bit of a chill down my spine. Until now, the game has been cool and atmospheric, and it has a great anime-inspired look, but it was at this precise moment that a 12-year-old me's blood pressure rose by several points. What was that? A male scream. Perhaps something has happened to Jean-Jacques. Gillian, please use extreme caution. I read multiple moving objects within the factory. This could indicate the presence of snatchers or insectors. To be honest with you, I still find this scream pretty awful to listen to. And that's a key, key ingredient of Snatcher. It's actually a pretty scary game. And despite the fact that you can barely even interact with it, say for a few first-person shooting gallery sections, its world carries a real sense of threat. Oh, dear God! I think by the point where they start scanning Jean-Jacques Gibson's stomach for traces of buffalo meat, I was pretty much hooked. This is just one example of one of those inspired little details and odd coincidences that Hideo Kojima does so, so well, and Snatcher is absolutely littered with them. Okay, let's try to sort all this out. Metal Gear, would you mind helping out? Not at all. Now projecting recorded video images. Gibson calls in and you two immediately head for the abandoned factory in the M District. But when you arrived, Gibson had already been killed by someone, or something, at the factory. From hair and skin samples recovered from his body, you determined that the perpetrators were two snatchers, one male and one female. In addition, from a floppy disk containing notes from Gibson's investigation, you discovered that snatchers have a crucial defect. Gibson was apparently killed because he had learned about this weak point. And this weak point is a key difference between them and real humans. Their artificial skin cannot tolerate ultraviolet rays. Long-term exposure causes it to become cancerous, a form of melanoma. This severely limits the places and times that they can operate to midwinter, when daylight hours are their shortest, and of course at night. And it looks as if it will take at least six months for them to develop a new skin which overcomes this fault. So their biggest weak point was that they had to keep themselves protected from ultraviolet rays over the past six months. Hmm, Gibson really put his earlier training as a science cop to good use in figuring this one out. And that's why they use plenty of sunscreen, even in the middle of the winter. As a result of this, it becomes clear that there is one thing they must have to continue their survival. And that is medical facilities, where they can treat artificial skin which has become cancerous. And it appears that Gibson may have located a hospital used for this very purpose. In an effort to determine where Gibson had been investigating, you analyzed his stomach contents, found buffalo meat, and headed to the only place in the city that serves it, Outer Heaven. Isabella Velvet, a dancer at this place, gives you a description, which allows you to put together a montage of the man Gibson was trying to track down. You then ran this montage through the city's data bank, using Jordan, and that gave you two suspects, Ivan Rodriguez and Freddie Nielsen. But from the condition of Ivan's skin, you determined that there was no possibility he could be a snatcher. There was no evidence at all of melanoma. But as he was in possession of Liquid Sky, you turned him over to narcotics. Following that, a search of Freddie Nielsen's home turned up large quantities of sunscreen. Nielsen's wife, Lisa Nielsen, turns out to be a snatcher, and you dispose of her. And you confirm that the skin cells found under Gibson's nails were from Lisa. 
Freddy Nielsen also turns out to be a snatcher, and you dispose of him as well. The hair sample that was found in Gibson's hand is confirmed as being from Freddy. So you are able to determine that these two snatchers, Freddy and Lisa, were the ones who killed Gibson. The world is crafted with a great sense of enthusiasm and fun. The director throws everything but the kitchen sink in an effort to really put the player inside this world. And it really elevates the material from generic Blade Runner Terminator ripoff to something genuinely atmospheric, threatening, idiosyncratic and unique. I've no idea how accurate the translation from Japanese is, because I don't speak Japanese, but the script in this game is a damn good time. The banter between Metal Gear and Gillian is always mildly funny, and over the course of the game, it really endears you to the characters. There's tons of little unlockable bits of dialogue, some of which I actually only saw during my last playthrough, some 25 years after my first one. Then there's a little fourth wall breaking bits, We're getting out of here! Sorry, I cannot go with you! What's wrong with you? Hurry it up! I am incapable of locomotion! What on earth are you blabbering about? Let's go! It's gonna blow! Please save yourself! I am paralyzed with fear! Oh, I can't believe this stupid robot! Come on! Volume turned up. Damn snatchers. And the myriad of cool little flourishes that occur all over the place, really. It may sound like fairly trivial stuff, but it all coalesces fantastically. Neo Kobe is a fun, organic, and deeply imagined world. And then there's the sound of this game. The Mega Drive sound chip really works miracles here and plays a big part in the overall vibe of the world as do the occasional Red Book audio tracks, but I actually think the voice acting itself is a really underappreciated aspect of this game. This is one of the few titles where I actually couldn't imagine playing the game with Japanese voices. Snatchers or Western voiceovers are a great match for the melodramatic, hyperbolic and cartoon-like sci-fi storyline. Gillian's voice in particular has precisely the right amount of cheese and warmth, and I struggle to think of anyone who could have delivered a line as ridiculous as this and still remain likeable and relatable. By the way, I understand you're suffering from amnesia. Any sign yet that your memory's coming back? I'm afraid not. I still can't remember a thing from before the army picked me up three years ago. You're married, aren't you? Yes, but we're separated now. She has amnesia as well, and without any memories between the two of us, I'm afraid there was very little to base a good relationship on. I can see your point there. This material just flat out wouldn't work with a serious, inverted commas, take on the role. And yet, crucially, the actors deliver their lines with no real sense of irony whatsoever. Just a simple sense of fun and enthusiasm. The whole thing just works. It hits the right tone. And by the time you reach the end of the game, all you want to do is spend more time with these characters. I want to go with you. Sorry, Mika. Hey, I'm a junker too, you know. I know, and you're a great one at that. So take me with you then. You head to the summit to warn the delegates. They haven't given up, you know. The summit's in Kyoto. I'm not going to be the only one to run. You've got to convince them not to use nukes on Neo Kobe. We found their hideout. There's no need now to sink the whole island. Yes, but... It's a tough job. Can you do it? Okay, Gillian. I'll do what I can. Thanks. Thank you, Mika. Don't say it, okay? Let's go, Gillian. Gillian? Yes? Um... Uh... What's wrong? How about dinner sometime? Dinner? Yeah, you know, dinner. Hmm. Mika. Not interested. 
I thought it would be nice, you know, to kick back, relax. It's Christmas after all. Christmas, huh? I'll be back by then. Gillian, we have to hurry. That's a promise, right? I heard you. Yeah, okay. But I gotta go to church first. I'll see you soon then. Okay, Metal, let's go. I'm no Kojima aficionado, but I have played a number of his games over the decades. Say what you will about the game mechanics themselves, I think it's pretty clear that this guy has a fantastic talent for world building. Even though unfortunately I find the story a bit flat and the gameplay itself a little bit, dare I say it, boring, the world of Death Stranding is an amazing place to explore. Filled with texture and detail, light and shade, fascinating tech, and a wonderfully melancholy, ominous, and at times, wistful vibe. Of the other Kojima games I've played, Police Notes, Metal Gear Solid 2, Metal Gear Solid 4, and Metal Gear Solid 5, I actually think that Snatcher is the most successful in terms of its storytelling, even though it's one of his earliest games. This is highly subjective, of course, but for me, all these other games have great elements, be it their game worlds or aspects of their scenarios and storytelling, but for some reason, they all end up feeling a bit lopsided. Metal Gear Solid 2 has some fascinating elements and great action scenes and huge amounts of spectacle, but the monolithic exposition and the heavy-handed social commentary towards the end of the game grew a bit tiresome for me. Police Notes has an amazing game world, possibly more engrossing and certainly more original than that of Snatcher, but despite some cool, likeable characters, another great soundtrack and the setting itself, the story itself falls pretty flat, lacking the sense of jeopardy and the dizzying twists and turns that you find in Snatcher. Snatcher also avoids the sort of tonal inconsistencies that are present in basically all of the Kojima games that I've played at least. Metal Gear Solid 5, for example, veers wildly from dour military realism to extreme silliness and flaming unicorns. Although I still enjoyed the game before I lost interest in it, it always caused me a bit of cognitive dissonance to be honest. The tone is just all over the place. For me, Snatcher is the tightest overall package. It's way more punchy than those other games, it doesn't labour under any sort of overt social commentary, well except for the bits at the end maybe. Throughout history, suspicion has always bred conflict. The real conflict though, resides in people's hearts. This conflict has just begun what the fuck that little adage has to do with the rest of the game is beyond me. But who cares? It has likeable, sympathetic characters, even though Gillian's a bit of a perv. Whoa! -ho -ho! You pervert! Get out of here! I hope you learned your lesson, Gillian. Uh, 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 a fantastic sense of tension and threat, and some genuinely horrific moments. Jeez, those things don't go down easy. A twisty turny story with more hooks than a Turkish kebab shop, and a dramatic conclusion that ends on a pleasingly open-ended note. I think ultimately, no matter how much he tries to elevate his material, these are the things that Kojima is great at. Get them! My arm! I can't reach my blaster! Uh, I'm hitting the leg! Is that the best you can do, Junker? Snatcher has no subtext whatsoever. It's just highly enjoyable in and of itself. It's no more and no less than a fantastic sci-fi horror soap opera comic book. Harry and I will be waiting for you to get home. That's Harry's hat. We can do it this time, Gillian. Not some fake couple like before. But with love and trust, 
I know, Jamie. Take care, Gillian. <laughs> I'll see you, Jamie. In the decades following its release, it's developed a hardcore following and its price has reached ludicrous levels on eBay, but Kojima himself has shown little enthusiasm for reviving the project. In this case, I think that might well be for the best. If you revived this thing with modern day graphics, unless it was handled very sensitively indeed, it would lose a great deal of what made it so engrossing in the first place. The music would probably be much more modern and much more sophisticated, and yet almost certainly less memorable. The storytelling would almost certainly have to be much greater in scope, and therefore it would probably lose some of its punch. As with all modern games, it would have to be about 800 times as much action, which would break the fantastic sense of anticipation and suspense that Snatcher has. In this game, coming up against a Snatcher is a rare occurrence, and so when it does finally occur, it has real impact. The bathtub is empty. That thing was filled with water just a few minutes ago. I read motion. This room. Damn. Where is he? Gillian, behind you! That was close. You're lucky I was here to save your skin. For me, one of the paradoxes of modern gaming is that giving you more freedom to interact often has the effect of taking you out of the game world, not putting you further in. Star Wars jank. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, look out. Get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. Wreck him. Punt him. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Yo, he Whoa. did get, uh, pretty right. much get punted, yeah. I didn't expect him to like float away like, like low gravity like that. As absolutely amazing as the prospect of walking around a fully 3D rendered Neo Kobe city is, I think this is one game that actually needs its restrictive visual novel conventions to really work. The storytelling is very tightly orchestrated, much like a movie or a novel. And as we all know, 30 hour action adventure games are movies not, even though there are a few such games that do manage to tell a relatively cohesive story within this framework. I'd argue that storytelling is not modern gaming's strongest suit. Given this game all the modern side missions, leveling up, etc, etc, I think would actually start to break my sense of disbelief, or at the very least, would fundamentally change the nature of the game itself. I'm not saying that a remake of this game wouldn't be a better game in many ways than the original, but much like Final Fantasy VII Remake, I think I can safely say that the two would in fact be two fundamentally different games. The medium is the message, after all. Whenever I finish a playthrough of Snatcher, I'm always left wanting more. I want to spend more time with the characters, I want to explore more of the world, and most importantly, I want to find out what happens next. Snatcher plays out in my head like a great sci-fi horror movie. You get a glimpse of this strange, horrifying and enticing world, but you can never quite touch it. Your brain has to work to fill in the gaps for you, and to try and make sense of the limited, yet fascinating data that it's presented with. The fact that you aren't whacked over the head with spectacle and visceral action is actually one of the reasons why it remains so unforgettable to those who've played and enjoyed it. So, for now at least, Snatcher sits there, suspended in time, in all its pristine digital glory, and I'm still dreaming of travelling to Russia with Gillian and Metal Gear Mark II, I'm blowing the shit out of some brazen Terminator ripoffs. Long live that dream. <laughs> <laughs>